recording in the studio would be me, David Bowie, Tony Bisciotti, Carl Salma, and George Murray. The way Bowie recorded, so what he would do is he would come in, meet him and George Murray, and Carlos would sit down. He would start singing the words, and we would come up with the idea, you know, first we come up with a bass line, then come up with a drum line to fit the bass line, and Carlos would come up with a rhythm line, then we do we knock out that song. Was he really picky about it? No, man. Whatever felt, when it felt good to him, it felt good to us. Right. So, so then we would then we do one song, then we go to the next song, same thing. You know, same thing. So it was like really fun to do it, you know, because Charles, Bowie and all these guys, they were so easy, Bowie so easy to get along in the studio. What did somebody like a Visconti bring to the equation? He was open. He was, um, he was very open. I like him because he was open-minded. In an interview, David Bowie said Dennis Davis, Carlos Alomar, and George Murray were backbones of the low album. And you have said they were jam experts. Can you describe how the jamming worked in the studio? Yes. Not everyone can jam the way uh, Dennis, Carlos, and George Barry could. They really locked in, you know, and it was kind of something you can't predict. We, Dennis and uh, Dennis and Carlos came first because on, on the Young Americans album we had another phenomenal bass player called Willie Weeks and uh, we got George Murray in and George Murray is a, was a little more sedate. George Murray, uh, bass players come in many sizes and flavors, you know. George Murray loves to lay down the, the bass, you know, really make it solid because like the drums, the bass is the other true rhythm instrument and when you get a drummer and a bass player that lock in together and I can only tell you uh, that that happens, doesn't happen with everybody. Certain drummers and certain bass players, when they get together, they are magic. And I have to say that about uh, Dennis and George. They really locked in. <laughs> songs written. He came in with lots of ideas, little demos he made. Uh, I don't know if he had a cassette play yet. No, he just had ideas and he played them. And uh, jamming is like, uh, if, you're a, if you're good at jamming in music, it's an irresistible force within you. As soon as someone plays you something, like your dad would just pick up his sticks and go, like, yeah, I hear something. He'd start, he, he, he can hear something in his head that would fit with what David was playing or David's guitar playing was. And Carlos would get right in and go, yeah, dunk, 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 da, da, da. You know, he just picked something up. George would start laying down the, the bass note. And within, that would be the basis. I mean, sometimes we would record within 15 minutes of the jam happening. You know, 15 minutes later we'd say, holy cow, we've got a song. This is a song, let's record it. <laughs>
meanwhile, uh, <clears throat> there were no words, no melody, <clears throat> just the jam. And uh, it's very, really, really hard to explain who can do, you know, when this, this is going to work. There are, I must tell you, there are jams we didn't use. They were, they were terrible. They just didn't go anywhere. They're, you know, so what? It's just a jam. Can, you know, with people like your dad and George and Carlos, they, they could jam for 24 hours and we would have uh, six albums worth of music, you know. But, you know, jams are very self-indulgent. They're free form. You have to start, when you're jamming to create a song, takes a person like David and myself and then Brian Eno you know, and channeling it in there like okay we're going here it's kind of all over the place let's get it in this groove here this let's focus on this part of the jam and then that that starts the songwriting so those three guys were experts so did you feel like the situation was kind of like let's just get some great players who are like in line with the vision for what we're trying to do and let them do their, what they do best? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man, yeah, that was an amazing thing. How much did my dad's drumming influence the music on low? I would say about 60% of low is the drum sound and your dad's drumming. Low was, was uh, two sides. The second side didn't have Dennis. It was just Brian Eno, David, and myself making these very dreamy, soundscapes you know that was different but the first all the songs on side one your dad played on it uh, i also had a uh, a brand new electronic device called a harmonizer which i i had only for a few weeks before we went to france and did this album and i had my own studio back in london and i put a tape up on my machine and i played a bunch of different sounds through the harmonizer and i realized it had a lot of potential in it with the harmonizer tuned just a little bit off, and you put a vocal through it, it sounded like two singers singing. So, you know, nowadays, well, since tape began, people would sing, and then they'd sing again over their voice so you could hear two people, the same person singing twice. You could, with the harmonizer, you could fake that very, very easily. It sounded very convincing. And, and uh, I tried it on bass. I tried it on guitar. Right on uh, strings, everything. Uh, in fact, I, I told Brian Eno and David over the phone what this thing could do, and they said, "Please bring that piece of equipment." And uh, we used the the harmonizer on the B side a lot. special trick I created with a snare drum and it was like if you hit the snare drum it would in the snare drum would have like a sound like boom in it this would take the boom and it would lower it in pitch like boom but it would do it with another knob it would continuously go down in pitch so your dad's snare drum was like boom that every time you hit it was boom like that and it kind of crackled on top of it your dad said, I love that sound. He says, can I have it in my headphones? And uh, we only put it in Dennis's headphones. So what else? Who else thought, thought this was too strange? Well, I loved it. And Dennis loved it. So what he figured out by having the headphones on was that he could actually play the harmonizer. If he hit it really hard, it would either go very low or sometimes it would, we would just kind of crap out and go, it's stunning. You're just a little girl with gray eyes. Never mind, say something. Wait until the crowd cries. Oh, wait until the crowd cries. You're just a little girl with gray eyes. Your love, for your love, for your love. 
Dennis realized when he played it, he was listening to it, he could actually play this very imperfect special effect. This, this is the days when those things weren't perfect. They did, they, they made wonderful noises, but they, you couldn't dial, dial in a sound exactly. But electronically, there just wasn't enough computing power in this thing. Also, Dennis would come in and say, hey, could you put that in a little bit? Could I hear what I'm playing, how it fits in with the rest of the track? I said, of course, you know, and I, I put the harmonizer in, and uh, finally, after Brian left the, the, uh, the album, David and I mixed the uh, album, and we realized that Dennis was creating something very, very special that wasn't really planned. But Dennis being so clever about playing the harmonizing sound really made the, the, the sound on the album that no one in the world had heard yet. And when we finally, we used it in the mix, and the harmonizer made it into the mix, and suddenly the drums became the feature of all of side one. The focus was on the drums. And of course, the songs were so minimal. David hardly wrote any lyrics. Uh, he was very minimal with his lyrics and melodies, that all you really could focus on was the, the band, the rhythm section, and especially the drumming. So that's how Dennis Davis single-handedly created this new sound. saying, how did you do that? How did you do that? My, that was my secret that was going to be revealed in a few months anyway, because I had the only one. I, I knew the, the president of the company, and I had the only one. <laughs> so sooner or later, people figure that out. But I wouldn't tell anyone. Mm -hmm. 